Well, salespeople have different selling styles, right? Does your customer have a specific buying style? Well, it turns out they have several different buying styles, and we're going to unpack the way a customer evaluates the purchase on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone to The Buyer's Mind, where we investigate exactly what's going on in the minds of prospects who are considering a purchase decision. This podcast is all about taking a stroll through the buyer's brain. It's about knowing the customer so well that that sale begins to roll out right in front of you. I'm your host, Jeff Shore. You can read the full bio in the show notes or you can visit jeffshore.com. While you're there, make sure you sign up for our free weekly video newsletter, a little Saturday morning inspiration to help you on your journey. It can also direct you to our YouTube page, and we have just got scores of videos that might help you on your day-to-day -day, uh, sales life. As always, we love to welcome our show producer, Mr. Paul Murphy. Murph, how's it going out in Colorado today? You know, the weather is actually very nice, uh, surprisingly, for this early in summer. I thought it would be hotter. Very, very nice, very nice. We're going to talk about buying styles. Murph, have you identified your buying style? What kind of a shopper are you? I didn't know I had a style. Am I supposed to have a style? <laughs> uh, bargain basement guy. That's who I am. Okay, fair enough. And that actually will fit into one of the buying styles we're going to talk about today. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that our customers are all different. They are very diverse. So let me give you our quote of the day. It's from Malcolm Forbes, who says, diversity is the art of thinking independently together. Diversity is the art of thinking independently together. Our differences are what makes us interesting. If we're all the same, how boring a world would that be? But when we consider the opportunity to think independently together, that's a game changer. I can think for myself and you can think for yourself but we can find that beautiful common ground of unity. It's a wonderful thing. And it's no different with a salesperson and a customer. The customer will be different. They will be different from you. They will be different from the next customer who's gonna walk through the door. At times, they'll be different than themselves. They'll think differently, they'll process differently, they will choose differently. When you understand that, when you respect that, when you build your presentation around that, it's all good. And that will flow very nicely into what we're gonna to discuss today. Hey, listen, make sure you stay tuned to the end of the podcast to learn about a giveaway that we've got going on uh, just for this month. Stay tuned to the end. We want to let you know that the podcast is brought to you in part by our good friends at HomestreetBank.com. Uh, they're not just our show sponsor. This is my lender of choice. I have used HomestreetBank. I have recommended them many times. They are professional, dependable, fantastic rates, great service. If you are a real estate professional listening today, you're not going to find better people to work with in taking care of your clients. So whether it's banking, home loans, credit lines, you name it, go to homestreetbank.com. You can learn more. That's homestreetbank.com. Well, coming up in just a few minutes, an interview with Dr. John Musser. He's a clinical psychologist who has turned into a sales expert. He's an expert in the way that salespeople think, but also the way that buyers think. It sounds like it's just the type of person we love to have on the buyer's mind. Before we get to that, our sales tip of the day, and that is to listen between the lines. You see, there are always two things being communicated in a sales conversation. There are always two things your buyer is trying to communicate, what they are saying and what they are feeling. What they say is in the words. What they feel is between the words. So what you'll find here, and I'm sure you've seen this in your own sales presentation, there's a customer talking, but you sense that there's more back there. There's an emotion that's coming through that gives you an indication that there is more to be learned. So if, for example, if I ask somebody, so uh, you know, tell me why you're thinking about uh, uh, updating your insurance policy. You know, maybe that's the question. Tell me why you're thinking about updating your insurance policy. And that customer said, well, you know, there's there's just been some things going on that have caused us to kind of reevaluate our priorities. Okay, now look, that would be that's a really obvious one. I'm overplaying that on purpose. You know, there's more. And this is a dividing line right here, because many salespeople would say, oh boy, this customer sounds awkward, they sound uncomfortable, I don't want to be intrusive, I'm going to, be, I'm going to back off. 
But the great salesperson understands that what's really going on is what really matters. Because if I do not understand what's really happening in this customer's life, then there's no way that I can provide them the right solution. Now, I'm going to suggest that you have to be careful, of course, in the way that you probe deeper. But I'm also going to suggest that you can make a living off of one phrase. And the phrase is, tell me more about that. Now, for those who have followed us at Shore Consulting for a long time, you have heard us talk about this phrase ad nauseum. And there are a number of different ways to express that. But that concept of tell me more is great because it lets that customer know that you do want to know more, but it's not specifically intrusive. It's just tell me more. The customer can still tell you what they want to tell you, but you want to be in the habit of having that phrase at the ready, tell me more. Well, before we get to our interview, let me tell you about an opportunity. I want to invite you to join us for the 2017 Jeff Shore Sales Leadership Summit and Expo in order for you to become a better leader for your team, to grow in ways that you never thought possible, and to take your career to an entirely new level. This is a premier industry gathering that centers around real estate leaders. Now, we've had people who are in other industries attend the summit, and they've never been disappointed. But just be aware that we're going to speak in the language of real estate leaders. Uh, you're going to learn from the best of the best about what it takes to make you a better leader, a better manager, a better coach, with more insights, more actual strategies, more aha moments than ever before, entirely new material. Now, I want to tell you right now, we are getting very, very close to a sellout. We sell out the summit every single year. We're going to sell it out again, and we're actually getting very, very close. So you're going to want to act on this right away. Go to jeffshore.com slash events. Just a couple of quick details about the summit. It's at the beautiful Lowe's Coronado Resort just outside of San Diego. It is an amazing resort. It starts on Thursday afternoon, goes all the way through Friday. You're going to want to spend the weekend. Trust me, in August in San Diego, it doesn't get any better than that. It is an amazing experience, and I want you there. Go to jeffshore.com slash events to learn more about the Jeff Shore Sales Leadership Summit and Expo. All right, let's get to our interview with Dr. John Musser. I've known Dr. John for years. We've had the pleasure of speaking on some of the same stages. He is a psychologist by training, a sales leadership expert by practice. John Musser is all about helping organizations to dramatically grow sales effectiveness. And you can learn more at salespotential.com. And I highly encourage you to go there and make sure you check out some very, very excellent and thought-provoking uh, blog posts while you're there. Moreover, uh, John Musser is just one of the really good guys on the planet. Not only have I learned so much from him over the years, I'm proud to call him a friend. John, welcome to The Buyer's Mind. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be with you. You started out as a, as a psychologist. You were a, a clinical psychologist. What caused you to make the jump into the business world and then specifically to look at what happens on the sales side of things? That's a great question. I really realized that I was an entrepreneur. I had no idea that I loved business as much as I did. And as managed care came along in California many years ago, I was making a lot less for every hour that I worked. Mm -hmm. And my entrepreneur side kicked in. Yeah. And I said, you know, I think I want to take um, earning money on my own shoulders and try to do sales. And so I knew that I needed to learn how to do sales if I was going to be a consultant and trainer and transfer a lot of the psychology that I had learned and give it to people in business. And I thought, you know, salespeople are pretty much dealing with psychology and people's psychology every single day. So that would be a great place for me to go contribute. And uh, But I knew I had to learn it myself. And so that's where I jumped in and... Um, tried to learn as much as I can. I still call myself a student of sales. I don't think I'll ever master it. So I join those out there who are listening, who are still consider themselves students of this whole profession that we're in. I think it's really the wise way to look at it. I, I feel very much the same way that I am a, a pilgrim on this journey, but it's, it is a rather interesting. I, I, if I was going to, uh, to give some advice to a salesperson about 
uh, somebody who wanted to extend their career, I would look at it and say, go learn more about psychology. It seems to be the perfect background study that you could carry into sales. And I'm sure you feel the same way uh, that I do, John, is that, uh, boy, I feel like there are days when I'm just scratching the surface of understanding what's really going on in the mind of the customer, right? It's so true. It's so true. I find that uh, right now in particular, Jeff, our our world is so oriented to being me first. You know, everything, all companies are trying to sell in an individual way to the buyer. And our culture is really focused on, you know, I need to really focus my ability to be successful as a career person. So I've got to put myself first. I've got to really strive to be the best. And so there's this me first, me first, me first, um, customized way that the world is focusing everything. And yet when you're a salesperson, you got to put yourself first to the side so that you can really focus on your buyer because letting them have a, a me first experience means I got to put myself as a salesperson to the side. I got to put myself second, put my needs to the side, my agendas, my pressures, my my stuff, I got to set it aside and really focus on my buyer when they come in so that I can be effective. So that whole thing that is happening right now in our culture um, is really challenging for us as salespeople to put the buyer first and really focus on the buyer and try, like you said, to figure out what's happening over there. Um, and what is it that they're wanting when they come in and they're looking for so that I can help them be successful and reach their goals? Tell me if you if you disagree with me on this, but I, I, I almost see it like uh, the salesperson should see themselves as if you think of a, of a rock star or a, you know, a, a famous musician, they get out there on stage and the lights are on them and the show is about them and they paid money to see them. But when you flip that around, that musician is looking at it, the really good ones are looking at it and saying, this doesn't mean anything. It is absolutely 100% about the experience of the person in the seat in front of me. Is that, is that a good analogy? Absolutely. Absolutely right on the money. And, and you know, we as salespeople, we are sort of on the spot, but the, the best salespeople, it seems to me, are the ones who can really be aware of, okay, who is this person that's just come in front of mm -hmm. me? And what is it about them that they're looking for? And how can I adjust myself to make their experience what they're looking for? So if there's one thing that we've learned here in the buyer's mind is that the typical customer is an incredibly complex beast, and we'll get into that. Let's start with the salesperson because sales professionals are complicated in their own way, and you contend that top salespeople excel at flexibility, at basically getting out of their own way in order to fully engage with the customer that is in front of them. There's a degree of emotional intelligence that that salesperson has to carry because that need for flexibility is going to be based upon how diverse, how different, how, how those different styles of that customer are going to shine through. Did I characterize that properly? Yes. Um, I think great salespeople, first of all, have to be very self-aware. I think we have to be uh, really aware, first of all, of our strengths, the things that we need to be prepared to be able to provide. So great salespeople have to be knowledgeable. We have to know how to uh, create connection with our buyers at all different types. We have to know what we're selling inside and out. We have to know our competition. We have to know um, so many different things to be ready, to be flexible, to give whatever that buyer is looking for. And if I'm a, a, a salesperson that's pretty rigid in the way that I do things, and I like to kind of have a routine and, you know, when you walk into my shop or you walk into my office or I walk into your office, that I do the same thing over and over, that I'm really not able to connect with the buyer because the buyer is going to not necessarily want to do things the way I do. So we've identified that there's certain things and styles that salespeople tend to gravitate towards. Some of that's due to training. Some of it's due to their experience. Some of it's due to their expertise. Some of it's due to just their personality. Um, and they rely on that because it has worked for them. But what they're not always aware of is it's worked for a certain percentage of people. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. It may not have been working for everybody, mm -hmm. but we tend to focus on what we think works best and we get comfortable and we kind of stay in that groove and we tend to repeat it. And I think that what I'm saying is, is that great salespeople are able to be extremely flexible and flex to whatever type of buying experience the buyer's asking for in the moment. And that even changes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the buyer, like you said, is incredibly complex. So a buyer may walk in, for example, and they may be really wanting, before they get down to business, they may want to get to know this salesperson. So they may have a real need to say, hmm, who is this person? Do I want to work with them? Do I like them? Do I trust them? Is this somebody that I really feel like I can open up to and even want to do a transaction with? And, and other buyers may come in and that's the furthest thing from their mind in the world. They're only there to figure out information that they couldn't get from the internet, right? So they look at the salesperson and they don't want to, get to know them they could care less about them as a human being mm -hmm. they don't care whether they trust them they just want to know can you give me information i can't get off the internet mm -hmm. and and so it's a completely different thing that they're looking for and the salesperson who's not aware of that at the beginning very beginning moments of that connection are going to miss the connection and they're going to miss that opportunity to really build trust quickly with that buyer uh, uh, Does that make yeah, sense? Absolutely. And I would just jump in here to our listeners, especially if you are a, a manager, a company owner, a CEO. Uh, and doc, I didn't tell Dr. John I was going to do this, but uh, uh, John Musser specializes in this evaluation of sales forces and individual salespeople, and he's got some amazing tools. So if you're looking at saying, how can I understand my own salespeople better, you're definitely going to want to reach out uh, to John Musser about that. John, your extensive study has led you to identify six distinct buying styles. And in that study, you've identified how selling styles need to line up to, that's what you were just talking about, right? That flexibility of the salesperson to be able to deal with those, those six di distinct buying cycles. Before we get into the six styles, and I do want to touch on each of them briefly, I, I, I think it's one of the important things that I noted in researching for this particular podcast was that customers will often switch styles midstream. So it, can you give us sort of an overview of how a customer kind of moves between styles and then we'll break down the six different styles? Absolutely. I want to use an example to illustrate this of an of a senior buyer. So let's give an example. Let's say you're, um, and I'm going to use an example just for to, to jump in and give an illustration of selling homes. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you've got a salesperson, they're selling a home. Let's say it's a retirement community. Let's say they're selling to an elderly person or a person who's getting ready to retire. Maybe they're downsizing, maybe they're simplifying their life and they're ready to really buy the last place they're gonna live. So that person may come in and the first thing that they may be focused on is, do I like this salesperson? Is this somebody that I like? Is this somebody that I can trust? We would call that the rapport-oriented buyer who's looking to find a connection to, the, to a human being first. But then as soon as they feel that they've established that, they may immediately start to want to know more about the specifics of the home, the builder, the whole um, specific parts of the house that they are very interested in. So they may, may be asking about the product. And we call that the product-oriented buyer. So they'll ask specific questions about construction and all about the specifics of what's included and all of that. And then the wife may start saying, well, how much can I customize this home? And what kind of granite can I have? And what are my choices and options? And now we've moved into another style of buying, which is the image-oriented buyer, wanting to know how it can be enhanced for image sake and how it's gonna enhance that couple's image in that community or reflect their personal style as a couple. And then once that's been addressed, they may go immediately into talking about price and saying, well, this seems like a little, it's a little expensive. We've looked down the road and your competitor is offering this and this, and now they're in a whole different focus. So now they're talking about price and we, we call this the competition 
mode of buying where they're trying to pit you against your competitor and get the best deal and do you have the best pricing? But then they may shift to, well, but what about warranties here? And what's the after purchase support? And you know, I'm gonna be retired. I don't wanna to have to mess with this house very much. I wanna be playing golf. I wanna be out there on the golf course. And the wife may say, you know, I wanna be out playing uh, tennis or be, we're playing and shopping with my friends. I don't wanna to have to be dealing with issues here at the house. And now we're talking about the service oriented buyer who's concerned about warranties, follow up, how much after purchase care the company has and their reputation and brand for after purchase. So you've got all these different types of focus that a buyer may have. And to your point, Jeff, it can shift on a dime. Mm -hmm. It, it, boy, it, it's confusing, to, to tell you the truth, uh, John, as I'm looking at it, and a little bit overwhelming as I'm thinking it through, because even when you're looking at this, and maybe you can elaborate on this just a little bit, going back to your clinical career here, if I look at somebody who is information-oriented, but switching to style-oriented, um, those are two very different parts of the brain. So what's tell us a little bit about the customer's mental journey. This cannot be easy for them to be able to sort of flex their brain and and to uh, recount you know, the balance between logic and emotion. And I, there are all kinds of things to unpack here. There are. And from my experience, Jeff, and I think probably from yours too, and for most of you out there who are selling, I think what you realize is that even though people may journey across these different priorities as they're in their buying process, there's usually a particular emphasis or focus that each person has that's the most important. So for instance, if you're working with a couple, like I was just giving the illustration, often one part of that couple is more focused in one of these particular styles of buying. For example, the wife may be more focused on the style of that home and how it's going to feel to live in it and what the surfaces are going to be and the color scheme and the choices and options that she has to create this home to be something that's a reflection of her style. That may not be the priority, the prime driver for the husband. Mm -hmm. The husband may be more focused on the actual specifics of construction, the actual what's included, which would be the product, or the after uh, purchase care, the service oriented part of that um, purchase, because is it gonna last? Is it gonna hold up? What's the warranty? What's the protection? Those two things may be more what the husband is more focused on in general, whereas the wife's focus may be more on relationship rapport. Do I like this person? Can I work with them? And is this going to be something that I can make mine? It's really going to be a reflection of me. So that personalization, that image oriented aspect, those two may be more of hers. So when you're a salesperson, you're actually working with two people that have a general track or a buyer's um, style it's going to be moving in a general way, but it may be more than one. So you actually have to be very aware of what are the typical ways that people focus their buying interests. And can I be, first of all, aware of those things that are sort of showing up as a typical track or a typical style, we call it. And then can I immediately be able to flex so that I give them what they're going to ask for? Um, and it's challenging because the husband will start talking about facts, data, information, specifics, buyer construction stuff, very detailed, very, very, like you said, Jeff, left brain. Mm -hmm. And then the wife will start all of a sudden at the same time, talk about how can I make this mine and how can I customize this and put the granite I want? And that's a completely right brained um, experience of the home that she's focused on <laughs> has very little to do with the actual technical construction of the home or the 
the uh, insulation quality or the details that are so um, technical and left brain. She's more focused on that right brain experience of living in the home. So there's a lot that you're focused on. There's a lot that you're managing. I have found that having these six styles is a great way to navigate all that's going on in front of you when you're talking to people. Because even though there are six possible things that people move through, typically they do it one at a time. Mm -hmm. And typically they're generally more focused on one of those uh, aspects of the purchase at that given moment. Um, so it makes the salesperson's job a little easier if you can quickly go, oh, okay, this person's really talking about products, so I need to give them specifics. Oh, okay, the wife's talking about this image part of this, so I need to focus now on my comments to her on the image aspect of this sale. What's interesting to me and here, so it, uh, if I could just cut in for a second, because what's interesting to me is the way you're describing ahead. this is that so often the salesperson has the potential to really screw up uh, what otherwise would be a fully engaged process. Because if a customer is in a style image frame of mind and a salesperson wants to throw a bunch of information and facts and data that we're, all we're doing is introducing confusion into that customer. We're, we're, we're not only are we not helping, we're probably hurting. Exactly, Jeff. That is that is the whole purpose of this technology. Mm -hmm. It's just what you just said. Mm -hmm. It's for us to track to first of all recognize what is it that they're asking for. What do they really want from me right now? What are they What are they needing? Are they needing the um, data? Are they needing relationship and connection? Are they needing competition and, and how I pit myself against the others out there? What, what are they needing? First of all, is recognizing that, right? So that's the first step. The second step is, can I then shift and get out of my need to do it the way I typically do it? so that I can give them what they want. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a meta narrative here that I, at least I think I'm picking up uh, around the idea that, you know, if, if you are so committed to your script uh, that you have to get your script out, you're probably doing this wrong because fundamentally we have to ask the question, are we selling the way that a buyer wants to buy or are we selling the way that a salesperson wants to sell or has been told to sell? And my contention has always been, if you know your customer well enough, that sale will roll out right in front of you and, and you can reverse engineer your sales presentation even according to the buyer who's standing right in front of you. is And that's goes right in the face, uh, John, of uh, other people who are gonna say, nope, this is our path, this is our script, and we're not gonna vary from it. I'm sure you've seen this conflict in your, in your line of work. Absolutely, and you know what I'll say, Jeff? I think that having a sales roadmap for salespeople is important. I think to be prepared is important, mm -hmm. to be knowledgeable is important, to be ready is important. But when a, you're really a professional, you are ready, but then you're able to put it to the side and truly be customer focused. To your point, Jeff, I think your, your whole emphasis of what you're doing here with your podcast and your, your emphasis to us in sales is so great because you're trying to help us say, stay buyer focused. Mm -hmm. Let's let them purchase the way that they are wanting to buy and give them what they need so that they can get to the place where they feel that they are able to make their buying decision. And, and my point is, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. They need different things at different times in that process. And we have to be flexible to follow them as they go through their check marks. They check off these different things that they're looking for. We're just about out of time. I want to ask you one last thing here. We'll go off the board on this one just a little bit. You wrote a blog that we posted on our site at jeffshore.com. I'll, I'll put the the uh, link in the show notes here. Uh, but you were talking in the blog, and it was just just incredible, a very, very powerful, powerful uh, uh, post here uh, where you addressed the ways of being, the ways of being. Can, can you can you talk a little bit about, about the ways of being? Because now we're moving away here from the customer buying styles here, but just into the mindset uh, of, a, of, a, of a salesperson. Talk a little bit about the ways of being. Mm, I love this uh, concept because 
you know, there, you can be so technically great at what you do. And I've seen so many salespeople that are phenomenally gifted in their knowledge and, and their technical expertise and their experience. But way of being means how are you showing up in the moment? What's your way of being with the person? And to me, salespeople who are curious, who are being curious, who are being open, who are confident, who are um, have a way of being of wanting to be of service, um, who are um, have a way of being that is welcoming and is inflexible. Those are ways of being that you can't teach. It's something that comes from inside the salesperson themselves, and it's. It, when you're showing up it, from a way of being, that's what to me is so critical in being successful with the public. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always said that the greatest salespeople are the salespeople who can really learn and listen and get to know their buyers and really pay attention to what the buyer's trying to say and what they're wanting. And I've always said that salespeople who are naturally curious and have that natural curious way of being about them make great salespeople. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is just fantastic stuff. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, John. It's, the website is salespotential.com for everything you need to know about uh, Dr. John Musser's work and, and including how to contact him. And if you're leading an organization of sales professionals, I just highly recommend that you do this. I, I, John, I have a feeling that we're going to have to do this again because there are so many topics we could dive in much, uh, much more deeply on. But uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for your expertise. Been my pleasure, Jeff. Thanks so much. All right. Well, Murph, uh, you sort of get the sense that Dr. John Musser is kind of a smart guy. Very smart guy. Really like uh, what he's written on the blog for us in the past as well. Yeah, that that ways of being is, uh, uh, is just such a strong blog post. We'll have that in in the show notes. He really emphasized the idea of flexibility, and uh, that's problematic, right? Because so many salespeople tend to be very rigid in the way that they want to sell. And if you put your consumer hat on for for just a moment, Murph, I I can imagine that that would kind of get under your skin, maybe even tick you off a little bit. Well, you know, a lot of times salespeople come to you and it, it feels scripted, like somebody's trying to tell you what they want. They're not ever asking me what I want. Yeah, absolutely. And and in defense of the salesperson, it's possible that they have been trained that way. They may have been brought up that way and uh, told that that's the way you're going to sell. But I think as Dr. John pointed out, uh, you know, it's going to come down to are are you selling the way that you want to sell, or are you selling the way that a buyer wants to buy? And when we get that buyer mentality first, when we're thinking first about the buyer and specifically about that buying style, then we can adapt. We can exercise that flexibility. We are not the star of the show. That customer in front of us is the star, and our job is to make it easy for them to buy. It's uh, it's awesome. Well, listen, hey, as we wrap it up, um, I just got to ask you, what does that awesome experience look like? What, what does an awesome experience look like? And and here's one thing that I can tell you for sure. Who wins when your customer feels like they had an awesome experience? Well, also, obviously, they win. There's no question about that. And obviously, your company wins. But I would suggest you win. Because when you take some time to think about awesomeness <laughs> and about how you deliver it, it's fun. It's invigorating. It's incredibly rewarding. I just had a conversation with this yesterday with a social selling guru, Jack Kozakowski, about designing awesome experiences. And it's absolutely in line what we just heard from Dr. John Mosser, the idea that your customer wants to have this awesome experience. But we tend to look at it and say that we want to build awesome experiences for the customer, and we should. But I also want to emphasize that when we build awesome experiences for the customer, we enjoy it ourselves. We enjoy that awesome experience. It is so wonderful. It is so rewarding. So I would just encourage you, I would challenge you to sit down and ask the question, what are the elements of an awesome experience? What does that look like? 
Hey, at the beginning of the podcast, I told you there'd be a giveaway. Today's giveaway is a copy of the best-selling book, Be Bold and Win the Sale. This is really a, a sales psychology book. It's about what boldness is, how we deal with discomfort in the sales process, and uh, how we can make sure that we are are, are, are helping our customer the best way we can by dealing with our own discomfort. So for your chance to get a copy, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash Jeff Shore community, all one word. Like the page, of course, and then find the quote from today's podcast in the comments and enter the hashtag buyer's mind and we'll pick a winner at random. That's all there is to it. Well, listen, uh, if you're loving the buyer's mind, and we hope you are, it would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the podcast. That would really mean a lot to me. It helps grow the podcast. It gets more attention that way. Uh, a review would mean so much. And a, a, a posting a link of, to your social media page, boy, I can't tell you how much uh, we would appreciate that. But that's a wrap on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. And until next time, go out there and change someone's world. Thank you.